Well, I can truly say I've never been introduced quite like that, Chris. <laughs> you cannot do worse, apparently. <laughs> I'll do my very best to live up to that very high bar for <laughs> this talk today. Well, aside from the introduction, it's great to be with you this morning. <laughs> no, in all seriousness, it is a joy and a delight to be here at the Ligonier Conference. In fact, as I reflected on some prior times I've done events for Ligonier, I couldn't help but think of, I think the last time I was here at Ligonier, I did the Reformation Conference up at the, the Bible College just north of Orlando and talked there on the origins and authority of the New Testament Canon, and it was a delightful time. And one of the, the most vivid memories I have of that last time uh, speaking at a Ligonier conference was actually just being on the stage with RC at the end, where we got to dialogue together and field questions together on the canon of Scripture. And that is a rich memory sort of burned in my mind I'll forever be thankful for as I think about his legacy. And of course, that legacy is still very much felt, obviously, here uh, this week together. But today, I'm not speaking on the origins of the Bible or the New Testament canon. I've been given a very different topic, as you know, as you've read, no doubt, the schedule. I'm going to be talking on this issue of God's design for marriage. And as that topic was given to me months ago, I thought to myself, how in the world in one session do you say all that needs to be said about the topic of marriage? And of course, the answer is you can't say in one session all that needs to be said about the topic of marriage. But there is a place we should begin. And I think Stephen Nichols already helped us realize where we begin for lots of these questions as we look at ethical issues in the Bible. And that is we always begin, of course, in God's Word. But even more than just beginning in God's Word, we often begin in the book of Genesis. And so if we think about marriage, there's one passage we have to begin with uh, together. And so if you have your Bibles, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, I want to read this short passage together with you and then offer a word of prayer as we dive into this very important topic together today. Now, of course, as you're turning there, you've already been in Genesis this morning with Dr. Nichols' lecture, and you already realize how foundational this is to everything that we believe, and certainly that's true for marriage as well. And so we start with this passage in verse 18 of chapter 2. Let's listen to see what God has to say to us in his word today. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is... At last, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Amen. Let's pray and ask God to bless this as we begin this morning. Lord, we know that marriage has come on to some rough times of late. Lord, we know that you love it and value it and have created it. Give us your grace today as we navigate this so important topic in our world today. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, I can still remember where I was when I watched it on TV. And my best guess is that many of you here today will remember where you were when you watched it on TV. It may, in fact, be the most famous wedding in the entire modern world. It was July 28, 1981. 
when a horse-drawn carriage pulled up to St. Paul's Cathedral in London and outstepped a 20-year-old lady, Diana Spencer. It was, on all accounts, a fairy tale. It was a modern Cinderella and Prince Charming, a woman who was not really a royal at all, not known, pretty much just simply a layperson, marrying the man who one day would be king. And 750 million people tuned in. Let that number sink in. 750 million people watched from 74 countries around the world. And the pomp and circumstance was unprecedented. There were many carriages that were horse-drawn. There were the royal guard on the horses with their shiny helmets and lances. There were leaders and dignitaries from all over the globe to watch this single occasion. Adjusted for inflation, the wedding cost an estimated $135 million. Those of you right now who have a daughter about to be married (laughs) can feel just a little bit better about your budget. (laughs) And then there was the dress. Everybody wanted to talk about the dress. In modern dollars, they estimate now that dress would cost today $450,000. The train was 25 feet long. No doubt you remember as you saw the procession down St. Paul's Cathedral how the train of her robe spanned what seemed to be the entire length of the aisle. It was, on all accounts, a dream come true. But of course, we all know the dream wouldn't last. Soon there was tension in the marriage. Soon there was coldness. Then there was fighting. Then after that, there were rumors of affairs. And then five short years later, in 1986, Prince Charles was able to declare that his marriage was irretrievably broken. By 1996, the two had formally divorced. And by 1997, so sadly, Diana was dead, having been killed in a car crash. What started out as a fairy tale wedding ended up being a Shakespearean tragedy. Now, as I think about that wedding and I think about even that marriage, I wonder if there's many other things in our world that can capture in one scenario the extremes of our world's view of marriage. On the one hand, you have the overly romanticized view of marriage, that marriage is the pinnacle of human existence, and if you just find the right person, all your problems will be solved, and the birds will sing, and the sun will shine. And on the flip side, you have the most pessimistic view of marriage, that marriage is awful, it's terrible, it ruins and shatters people's lives, and leads, in this case, and some strange, bizarre turn of events, even to someone's death. Perhaps no surprising then when you think about marriage in our modern world that it's fallen on tough times. It's not just the story of Charles and Diana that's caused it to fall on tough times. You yourself know as you look around the world that there's this general malaise about marriage today. Yes, most people that we know are married. I would imagine that most people in this room are probably married, but being married doesn't mean you have the right view of marriage. Being married doesn't mean you rightly value marriage, and now we hear all kinds of things about marriage, that marriage is not really even necessary, that marriage is just a a piece of paper, that marriage is overly restrictive and limiting, that marriage stifles individual identity, that marriage is a 1950s cage to trap you in, and on and on it goes. Of course, we don't even have to talk today about how marriage is being challenged and redefined as our culture wants to go in all kinds of new pathways and directions. Perhaps it's not surprising then to learn, as I learned just recently reading the U.S. News and World Report, that as of 2020, the frequency of marriage, the rate of marriage in our world is at an all-time low. In fact, since statistics were kept since the 1800s, there has never been a time in all of modern history, history where people get married more infrequently in the Western world. Of course, it's not just declining rates of marriage that are interesting, it's also people are getting married later. They're older when they get married. 
Let's let this stat set in. In 1978, people between the ages of 18 and 34, about 60% of them were married. 60% of people between the ages of 18 and 34 were married in 1978. Today, that number has dropped to 29%. Now, when you look at these numbers, it's disheartening. And it would be all too easy, I think, to reach the conclusion that, you know, the reason marriage is on the rocks is because we live in a a pagan world that doesn't love God and his word. And I imagine in some sense that's true. There's no doubt in some sense it's true that marriage is having hard days because we live in a world that maybe just wants to buck up against Scripture. But I want to also suggest, though, that many people struggle in their view of marriage, not so much because they're anti-God's word, although they may be, but because they themselves have grown up watching and seeing a broken marriage. How many thousands of people have grown up in homes where they saw all the pain, all the division, all the dysfunctionality, all the heartbreak of a bad marriage? In other words, perhaps the malaise over marriage isn't just about people rejecting God's word, although it can be that, Perhaps the the malaise about marriage is generations of broken marriage, generations of sin that have now had their effect. And honestly, we can have compassion on those many, many people who find themselves coming out of marriages like that um, and wondering how they got there. In fact, statistically speaking, I imagine there's probably many in this room who maybe have grown up in homes that were a broken marriage. Just statistically speaking, you may have been in a very home where your parents were the ones that fought. Your parents maybe got divorced. Maybe in your family there was infidelity. So marriage is having a rough go of it. So what we need today is in some sense a a rehabilitation of this idea of marriage. Now in this one little talk, of course, we can't get there. We can't fully rehab marriage and one talk. But here's what I want to do. Based out of this passage in Genesis 2 that we read earlier in some of the surrounding verses, I want to just offer five truths about marriage today. Five truths. Now, of course, we'll move through these quickly, but these are five things that we want to at least say today about marriage. It's not all that can be said about marriage, but certainly something that we need to get out of the gates. So let's jump into these five things together. First thing of the five, marriage is a divine institution. Marriage is a divine institution. We begin with the most foundational fact about marriage. The thing that we want to begin with is that it was God's idea. It was God who made the world. It was God who made humans. It was God who made the male and female. And it was God that declared they should come together in marriage as one flesh in that passage we just read moments ago. What this means then is that, of course, marriage, therefore, is not the invention of any particular culture, any particular person, any particular philosophical sect. Marriage is not something that was formed by a nation. No, it predates countries. It predates governments. It predates political parties. Marriage is not the creation of Republicans. Marriage is not the creation of Democrats. It's not something authorized by the city of Orlando or the state of Florida or any other state. Marriage is authorized and instituted by God. And if marriage is given by God, that means God gets to regulate it. God gets to define it. God gets to declare what it is and what it isn't. It's interesting in our day, of course, everyone has an opinion about marriage and what it should or shouldn't be. But God, in his word, as we know, has gone to great lengths to define what marriage should look like. I don't know if you ever thought about it before, but there are a lot of great institutions in the world that God doesn't really regulate in his word, doesn't really talk about much in his word. Take the institution of of schools or universities. Those are good institutions. We'd be fans of those in general. But God doesn't give us all this instruction in his word about schools and universities or educational systems. There's some guidance in some places, but he does regulate marriage. And if that's true, here's the implication. That means we look to his word as the ultimate guidebook, the ultimate handbook, the ultimate instruction manual for what it should and shouldn't be. Now, let's be honest. Not all of us read instruction manuals. 
I'm convinced that in every marriage, there is an instruction manual reader and there's a non-instruction manual reader. <laughs> this is true in my marriage. It always happens at Christmas, you give someone some new piece of fancy electronics and there's the person that says, I'm not touching this thing until I read every single line in the handbook. And then you've got other people like, ah, who cares about the handbook? I'm just gonna jump in and figure it out on my own. And everybody has those two proclivities. But when it comes to marriage, this is not something we figure out on our own. We need a guide, we need a handbook, and it always will be and always has been God's own word. So the first thing I want you to take away today is that marriage is a divine institution. Now, second thing to take away today of the five is that marriage is a good institution. Marriage is a good institution. Now, of course, on one level, you think, well, that's obvious. If God is the giver of marriage, then isn't it clear that it's a good institution? Isn't it sort of built into the idea of God gives it? Well, yes, but of course, we've already seen that our world doesn't think it's good. Our world doesn't think it's worth it. But we see in this passage that marriage is good in a number of ways. Let me just mention a couple ways that it's good. First, it's good personally. Marriage is the way God has brought human beings together in intimate relationships. It's not the only way he does it. There's other ways that humans relate that are intimate and have fellowship, but the man and the woman is sort of the centerpiece of what it means for human beings to be in relational intimacy with one another. I want you to notice verse 18 again, which you read momentarily uh, earlier on. Notice this amazing statement. Then the Lord God said, it is is not good that man should be alone. Now, of course, you know that if you just read Genesis 1 before this, Genesis 1 is a long litany of it is good. God made it and declared it to be good. God put something in place and declared it to be good. So it's, it's good, it's good, it's good. We get to verse 18 of chapter 2. It's not good. What's not good? Aloneness. The man is by himself. And then he describes marriage with the greatest intimacy. We saw it. Look at, I mean, how intimate is this? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall even have a name like his name, woman out of man. The Hebrew reflects this. The Hebrew word for man, ish, woman is isha. They're intimately linked. So intimate, in fact, that they're both naked and not ashamed. Truth be told, that's what we all want out of human relationships. That's what we all want out of marriage, this beautiful picture of companionship, intimacy, that you could freely be with another person without fear or shame. God knows your desire, and he's given something for that. It's called marriage. It's interesting that God didn't just come up with this idea sort of out of the blue, the idea that people should be in relationships with one another, because God is a relational God. From eternity past, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Trinitarian, loving one another within the Godhead. So is it no surprise then that he builds marriage as the wonderful fulfillment of what relationships can and should be? So marriage is good personally, but it's not just good personally. Here's another thing about it being good that's important. It's also good globally. It's good for the world. Here's a mistake that's often made in discussions about marriage. People think that marriage is, is basically all about us, that marriage is only about my personal fulfillment, that marriage is just an existential thing to make me feel good individually. Well, God does want to bless you personally. God does want to give you intimacy, but marriage is much bigger than that. Marriage is about more than us. What is marriage about? God's plan for the world. Let me explain what I mean by this. If we had time, you don't need to turn there. If we had time, we could go back to chapter one, and I think Stephen may have even mentioned this in his first talk, where God gives what we call the dominion mandate in Genesis 1.28. Here's what he says. Here's the marching orders for this new married couple. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over it. As I said, this is in theological terms known as the dominion mandate, and it's very simple. God has given the world to humans to have dominion over, and his number one goal at this point is I want you to fill it up. I want you to multiply. Now, you might think, why is God so concerned about this? 
Why does God have it on his agenda that, well, I want you to fill up the world. I want you to, to spread little human beings all over the world. Well, there's a reason for that. And actually, it's fitting that this talk comes after Stephen's because God made human beings in his image. As we've already heard, they reflect his glory. When you see a human being, you see a reflection of their creator. They are little bitty images of God all over the world. It's not that different than when you have a child, right? What's, what's one of the greatest joys for parents? When you have a child and someone comes up to you and says, oh, your little boy looks like their father. The little daughter looks like their mother. And there's a sense in which children are little images of their parents. It's so that way also with the divine image in each one of us. Each person out there reflects God's image, even if they're not a Christian, even if they're not a believer. So why does God want to spread human beings all over the world? Because it glorifies him to have his image all over the world. To increase and multiply is a way that God is glorified as his image is spread. And here's the key. That spreading happens through marriage. God has given marriage as not just a blessing for us individually and personally, yes, but globally, it blesses the world. Do you realize that even out there in the world, even if they're not believers, even if they're not even Christians, even if they're another religion, if someone gets married and has children, there's a sense in which that glorifies God by virtue of fulfilling the dominion mandate and bringing more image bearers into the world to give him glory. Marriage is a good institution. Okay, on to the third thing. Marriage, though, thirdly here, is a fallen institution, a fallen institution. When you read Genesis, if you're like me, you think to yourself, wow, that, that sounded like a really good idea, what God had lined up here. And then things went really badly. We know in the very next chapter here, chapter 3, that it wasn't long after God established this wonderful marriage concept that there was the rebellion of Adam and Eve, there was the bringing of sin into the world, there was the fall and the curse, and things that started off so good so quickly went bad. Have you ever thought about all the ways marriage is affected by the fall? We don't have time to turn to Genesis 3 and go through them all, but let me just mention a few of the things that marriage has done to the fall that we pick up in Genesis uh, or that fall has done to marriage that we pick up in Genesis 3. First, the intimacy is gone. Remember, you could be together naked and unashamed because of that great intimacy, but then we realize once they've sinned, they realize their nakedness and they're ashamed, and they go out to buy or to, 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 to get fig leaves to cover their nakedness, and you realize there's a sense in which now there's a break in the intimacy. A second thing that happens is they begin to fight with one another and blame each other. God comes to confront them about the fact that they've eaten of the tree, and he asks Adam, what's the deal here? And of course, Adam does what every man has done ever since for thousands of years. It's that woman you gave me. <laughs> wonder how their dinner conversation went that night after that wonderful move. <laughs> Honey, I've got something to bring up to you. God asked you about the problem, and you pretty much threw me under the bus. But it's not just that they have this broken relationship. Now there's almost war with one another. We read in 3.16 that the woman now is, quote, against her husband. And we also read that the husband will rule over his wife. And almost all scholars there take that as ruling over in a domineering, harsh, and sadly even sometimes abusive ways, which also has played out in our world for thousands of years. And then on top of all of this, the fall has affected the dominion mandate, the idea that you go out and you increase and multiply. Now childbearing is harder. Now we have infertility. Now we have all the problems that flow out of the fall in sin. What does that mean for today? It means what you already know before you even walked in here today. Marriage is hard. Even when it's good, it's hard. Even the best marriages can be hard. Even marriages between believers can be hard. Now, of course, in one sense, you don't need me to tell you that. But our world, as we've already indicated, still has this overly romanticized, idealized way of looking at marriage that will backfire on you someday if you don't take into account the fallen nature of marriage 
in our world today, and even believers have started following that ideal. I mean, just think about it for a moment. Every Disney movie, every Hollywood romance, everything you watch on television prevents a vision that, okay, all you have to do is find the right person, your soulmate, you go out and you get married, and everything's going to be right in the world, it's going to be romantic, it's going to be wonderful, the sun will be shining, the birds will be singing, it's perfect. And then there's shows that say, well, tell you what, we'll help you find your spouse by whisking you away to some Caribbean island somewhere, and you can pick the spouse of your dreams, and we'll give you candlelit dinners on the beach as the sun is setting, and lo and behold, it seems that you fell in love. But then, of course, we always know if we check back in with these couples and six months after the show ended, hardly any of them are ever still together. My wife and I always joke together, if you really want to find out if you're compatible with someone, don't go to the Caribbean and have a candlelit dinner. You'll fall in love with anybody in that scenario. <laughs> if you want to know if you're compatible with someone, try hanging wallpaper together. That'll tell you <laughs> whether you're compatible. Right now, many spouses are looking at each other in the audience, I think. So, remember that time we hung wall? Never do that again. <laughs> Here's the point. If we're going to make it through marriage today, if you're going to survive in marriage today in a fallen world, it will not happen on its own. It does not just happen naturally. You don't drift into a good marriage. If there's a fall... If it's broken, if we're sinners, then marriage requires gospel-saturated, grace-motivated, scripture-guided diligence from both individuals and churches to make it. Don't be surprised that marriage is hard. Of course it's hard. You live in a fallen world. What do you expect? My fear is that many people abandon marriage, not because they think so lowly of it. Many people abandon marriage because they have a highly romanticized, almost idolatrous view of it, and when the idolatry doesn't meet all their needs, they look for a new God. We need a new perspective on marriage. It has to be looked at through the gospel. And on that score, that leads to a fourth thing today about marriage. And that is, fourthly, marriage is a redemptive institution. Marriage is a redemptive institution. After reading all the things that went wrong with marriage in chapter 3, if you're like me, you're like, well, <laughs> things started off great, went bad. It's like, it's like the Diana and Charles wedding, right? You have this wonderful optimism and then total destruction. You're like, what could ever be done? And God says, I'm going to do something. All of the things caused by the fall, I'm going to fix. And he promises it, of course, in verse 15 of chapter 3, what is the proto-gospel of the whole Bible, the first promise of grace that the Bible sees. It's an amazing thing that you've read before, but I'll read it again. God makes a declaration to the devil, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, Genesis 3.15 is the first promise of a Savior. A baby will be born at some day down the road from a woman, from a marriage. A baby will be born, and this baby will be the Savior who will crush the serpent's head. He will be the snake killer that defeats the devil. In fact, it would not be too much to argue that the entire Bible after Genesis 3 is all about waiting for that baby, longing for that child. At every stage along the way, there's this sort of palpable anticipation among God's people. Is this the one? Might this be the Savior? Could this be the promised offspring that will finally crush the serpent's head? In fact, interestingly, even in the very next chapter of Genesis, after the, the mess with Cain and Abel, what happens? Adam and Eve have another child named Seth. And here's what Eve says. It's very insightful. She says, I have given birth to a man. What might she be thinking? Scholars think that what might she be thinking is she might think this might just be the promised baby that will crush the serpent's head. Of course, Seth wasn't the promised baby, as we know. Generations would go by as people wait and long for what would come. 
You ever wondered why the Old Testament's so obsessed with genealogies and so obsessed with the family line? Is it any surprise that Matthew begins with a genealogy? Because it all leads up to one particular baby that would be born of a woman that would crush the serpent's head. Here's the thing I want you to realize is that marriage is a redemptive institution because through marriage, through generations of families, God was going to bring a Savior. He was going to bring a child born into the world to redeem it. Marriage is a mechanism then which God would bring the Redeemer to save his people from their sins. Now, of course, there's more that can be said about the redemption through marriage. We could also talk about covenant lines, that God blesses covenant families. That's another thing worth noting here, that it's not just that there's one baby that will be born, but God will have covenant families who raise children in the fear of the Lord and teach them his word, and that God works through families. He works through marriages. So how is God going to spread his word throughout the world? He does it through marriages, through parents who love Jesus and teach it to their children and pass it along. Marriage is a redemptive institution. But that just leads up to the fifth and final thing here this morning, which is really where all this goes to. Marriage is all the things we've said thus far. But it's also, fifth and finally, a gospel institution. A gospel institution. Let me explain what I mean by this. As soon as we talk so much about how wonderful marriage is, and it is, As soon as we talk about how important marriage is, and it is, there is a mistake that can be made. It's a mistake that I see a lot, and it's a mistake that is easy for us to grasp a hold of. And here's what the danger is. When we look at how important and central marriage is to God's plan, some can think, therefore, that marriage is the pinnacle of all human existence. That without marriage, somehow someone is defective or deficient. And that the height of human existence is to finally be married and all your problems will be solved. But marriage is not the pinnacle of human existence. I think to think that way is mistaken for a number of reasons. Let me just mention what they are. For one, Christ was never married. He was not deficient. He was not lesser. Christ was not defective because he wasn't married. He was the ultimate human being the perfect human being, and he was never married. Beyond this, Paul indicates that if you want to do Christian ministry, that doing Christian ministry in marriage is a wonderful option, but it can distract you, it can limit you. But if you're single, you can do ministry in all kinds of ways you can't otherwise do. Paul actually lauds the possibility, if you have the gift of singleness, that singleness is a way to do Christian ministry. Here's the point. Marriage is pointing forward to a greater reality. Marriage is pointing to something beyond itself. Another way to say it is marriage is provisional. Marriage is anticipatory. What is it looking forward to? Paul actually tells us this in another passage you know well, Ephesians 5. That wonderful passage about marriage and husbands and wives and how they should treat each other, interact with each other, the roles of a husband and wife. It's such a critical passage. But at the end of all this discussion of marriage, Paul does a stunning move in Ephesians 5.32 when he says this, this mystery I'm talking about of marriage, this mystery is profound and I'm saying that it, marriage, refers to Christ and the church. Marriage is a blessing, yes. Marriage is good, yes. Marriage is important, yes. But marriage is actually not about marriage. Marriage is about something better, something bigger, something greater to come, namely the wedding day between Christ and his church. Marriage is about the gospel. Marriage is about what's going to happen in the new heavens and the new earth. Marriage is about how Jesus loves sinners and saves them for himself, that he is the bridegroom, always wooing and chasing his bride. In fact, one of my favorite stories in the gospels is when the Sadducees come toward the end of the Gospel of Mark, trying to trick Jesus with their best theological question. I always love these stories. You can imagine the Sadducees in some room somewhere as a committee saying, all right, guys, what's our best theological conundrums? Let's think them up. we got to pick one. 
so we can go present it to this Jesus of Nazareth guy and try to trick him and fool him. And so apparently they came up with one, and it was about marriage. You know the story. It happens in Mark chapter 12, and the idea comes from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is, is that if you have a brother who's married and the brother dies, you should take that wife as your own. It was a common custom in Old Testament times to try to provide for widows in need. So they came up with this brilliant solution, or brilliant uh, conundrum rather. What if there were seven brothers, they said to Jesus, and each one of them dies in order and they marry their prior brother's spouse. When they get to heaven, whose spouse will she be? And then you could see they're all high-fiving each other in the background thinking, oh, we got it. (laughs) And then Jesus reaches out and pulls the pin out of the whole deal with one simple fact. In the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no marriage. Why? Because you'll be married in a different way in the new heavens and the new earth. You'll be married, but it's the church that's married to Christ the greatest wedding there could ever be. Why would you go back to the, to, the, to the type when now you have the anti-type? What you realize then is that the Bible is all about a wedding. You realize that the Bible is the greatest romance novel ever written? I bet you never thought of it that way. You think about romance novels, no one ever mentions the Bible. You should mention the Bible. It's the greatest romance novel ever written. It's the romance of God with his people, the church, and he's the great pursuer, the great lover. She rebels. She runs off with other gods. She runs off in adulterous relationships, and he pursues her, chases her, loves her, and eventually there'll be a wedding when he marries her. And Jesus talked about it. It's the great wedding feast of the Lamb. Don't you want to be there? Just a word to singles this morning as we're talking about marriage. Some of you are here and you're not married. So maybe you want to be married. And that's good. And marriage is a blessing. We've already talked about that. But be reminded, the pinnacle of human existence is not being married. The pinnacle of human existence is knowing and loving Christ. And if you know and love Christ, there's other ways to be a father. There's other ways to be a mother. There's other ways to be a brother and sister because you're in the family of God. And in the family of God, it's like one big family. You can be a spiritual mother. You can be a spiritual father. You can mentor younger people as a spiritual brother or spiritual sisters and have, in one sense, spiritual offspring. And that spiritual offspring will therefore be your children at that great wedding day yet to come in the new heavens in the new earth. So five things we've seen about marriage. Marriage is a divine institution. Marriage is a good institution. Marriage is a fallen institution. Marriage is a redemptive institution. Marriage is a gospel institution. So where do we go from here? So much that can be said about where to go from here, but let me just mention one idea, one thing to put on your mind. You have a wedding to plan. Some of you have actual literal weddings to plan. You're probably thinking about that a lot. But I want you to realize everybody in this room, married, single, children, no children, doesn't matter. All of us have a wedding to plan. All of us have a wedding to look forward to. Be about that wedding. Plan for it. Long for it. Look for it. Because someday the groom is coming to claim his bride for himself, and that will be the greatest wedding imaginable. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we're so grateful for your word. We're so grateful for marriage. What a great blessing. What a core central thing that it is. Lord, help us preserve it. Help us defend it. Help us uphold it. But more than anything, Lord, help us see that it points forward to that great moment where Christ comes to take his bride to be with her forever. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.